Hey guys, thanks for watching. Welcome back to This Old Thing. I'm Jessie Sage. This is my cat, Olive. <laughs> she just came in from the rainstorm. <laughs> she always looks mad, but she's very sweet. She just came in, so I have to dry her off a little bit. So I just finished reading chapter five, and it was a very short chapter. So I thought that I could go ahead and just read chapter six for you guys while I'm here and I have everything set up. Oh, okay. He's gonna go. Say bye. Okay, so we are reading The Girl in the Centerfold by Saray Marsh. We're on chapter six. And I've put the playlist with all the chapters down in the info box below. So if anyone wants to go back and start on chapter one. But if you're just joining, you really don't have to. But there's just, I mean, there is a lot of really interesting stuff. But if you just happen upon this, you can also join in. Because each chapter is kind of like, becomes an interesting little essay about Playboy. So if you don't have time to listen to the whole thing, you can just listen to this. Oh, also I'm wearing red lipstick today because I heard in Holly Madison's book, Down the Rabbit Hole, that Hugh Hefner hated red lipstick and he said it made her look old, hard, and cheap. And that's the look that I'm going for today, so <laughs> I had to pop that on. So, oh, I almost started on chapter seven. Oops. Oh, I'm excited because this chapter, she chooses her pseudonym, Saray Marsh, and she describes how she chooses it and kind of describes how you pronounce it. And that's how I say it, but I'm curious if you guys would say it Marche or Marsh. So when we, <laughs> through the book. So when we get to that part, comment below how you would pronounce it. Okay, now I lost my phone. Here we go. Okay. So also don't forget to subscribe and like this video. I love reading your comments about everything you think as we're going along. And it also really helps me to just get this video out there to more people. And I love that her writing that's so rare and hard to find is getting out there to people. So thanks for doing that. Chapter six, the gold room. Olive, you can't be eating and snacking when we're reading the book. Okay, she's done now. Okay, here we go. Chapter six, The Gold Room. The following Monday, I was on an American Airlines jet for Chicago. I wore a tan suede coat trimmed in black leather and an olive dress with a design of little flowers in it and carried white luggage. I had a round trip ticket supplied by Playboy. I was also in an emotional state a sort of mental equivalent of a basket case coming down with St. Vitus' dance. Part of the time, I was petrified. I didn't know a soul in Chicago except Pompeo Pozar. Good old Pompeo Pozar. I had only the vaguest notion what I was getting into. Now, the blouse please off. I had nightmares about standing naked before thousands of stern and disapproving men, all wearing white coats. Suddenly, they started to laugh. They became hysterical with laughter. My reaction to my fear was grit the teeth determination. I had agreed to do this thing. There was no backing out. I was a big girl, and I'd act like a big girl. No shivering, no sweating, no protesting. I was going to do what was expected of me. Part of the time, I was thrilled to death. Me. One of the most beautiful girls in the world. I remember standing before the mirror, naked. I tried to tell myself, yes, I was gorgeous. Anyone would think so. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest one of all? Not you, booby. <laughs> would you believe it's June the bosom Wilkinson? A girl with a beautiful body ought to share it with mankind. It was like great art. Rembrandt. Degas. Titian. How do 
do you say that word? Titian. A sharing of beauty. There was nothing dirty about it. Now what am I offered for this fine reproduction of Miss Salve Mellenborgen? Sold to the gentleman with a lecherous grin for two cents. Part of the time I was simply excited. A great, new, splendid world of Hollywood and fame was to open up for me. Stepping out of her chauffeured limousine is the celebrated Salve Mellenborgen. She is absolutely stunning and buff. Wherever did you buy your costume, Miss Mellenborgen? You made it yourself? My, such talent. I was also excited at the prospect of living in Hefner's mansion. In the January 1966 12th anniversary issue, I was to be in the 13th. Playboy published a 22-page, 14,000-word article on Hefner's house. I read every word in it several times. My, it must be a palace. And Mr. Hefner, what a man he must be. Imagine living like he did, and right in Chicago. Many things impressed me. Names, for example. The article was full of names. Shel Silverstein, Johnny Carson, Skitch Henderson, Mort Saul, Jules Pfeffer, Pfeiffer, Theodore Bickle, Bob Hope, Martin Belli, Richard Gaiman, Herb Cahan, Theodore Roosevelt, Norman Mailer, Bud Schulberg, Don Adams, Dick Gregory, John V. Lindsay, Nathan Leopold, the Maharaja of Jaipur, Mel Torm, Torme, David Jansen, Bob Hope, it says again, Jules Pfeiffer, Mort Saul, Marvin Belli, the Reverend Harvey Cox, Dr. Paul Gebhard, Oleg Cassini, Otto Preminger, Salmineo, Sal, Salmineo, June, the Bosom Wilkinson, Hugh O'Brien, Mort Saul, Alan Sherman, Jerry Lewis, Mort Saul, Lenny Bruce, Elia Kazan, Kazan, Dick Gregory, James Meredith, Steve Rossi, Ann Richards, Norman Mailer, Dick Gemmon, Lee Marvin, Michael Dunn, Mort Saul. My, Mr. Hefner knew lots of people. Just imagine, Mort Saul and Theodore Roosevelt. But who was Theodore Roosevelt? The article made me think it must really be something to be an important person like Mr. Hefner and live as he did and know all those famous people. Everything about him was special. His dog, for example. It was no ordinary dog. Quote, the hairy hulk asleep near the fire is Humphrey, the mansion mascot an 18-month-old, 200-pound, and still-growing St. Bernard. Humphrey was named for Bogart. Hefner is a bogey fan, although Hef grudgingly admits that as the dog gets bigger, he looks less like his namesake than like a shaggy Sydney Greenstreet, who was often cast as Bogart's nemesis. Humphrey, a relative of a St. Bernard pup named Playboy that Hef gave to Sammy Davis Jr. a few years ago, end quote. We never had dogs like that in Norway. Not only did Mr. Hefner know people and dogs, he knew things. For example, I had an old $19.95 tube radio in a plastic white case. I thought it was a very nice radio until I read about Mr. Hefner's. Quote, behind the giant couch and with it acting as a room divider is the main room's custom-built 15-foot free strand freestanding stereo hi-fi console with a pair of turntables, RecoCut manual, and Gerard automatic, an Ampex professional size stereo tape recorder, Scott AM FM stereo tuner, Macintosh amplifiers, Marantz preamp, and enough dials, knobs, buttons, and switches to satiate the most dedicated gadgeteer. End quote. Phew. What was my $19.95 white, white plastic RCA Victrola table model radio next to that? Worse, I'd never even heard of James B. Lansing and his graf graphic controller. Every word I read made the house sound so exciting. Quote, the entrance to this 20th century castle has the most contemporary electronic equipment 
electronic equivalent of a medieval moat and drawbridge. This turns out to be a closed circuit TV system that gives all visitors the once over before they are allowed to enter. Imagine, the foyer is decorated with a quote, heroically proportioned seven foot semi-abstract bronze statue of modern woman by sculptor Abbott Pattinson. I could hardly wait to see that statue. The article went on and on, revealing the wonders of the house. The guest book I'd get to sign, the abstract splatter painting number 26, 1950 by the late Jackson Pollock, second only to Picasso in the hierarchy of 20th century art, the main room big enough to hold basketball games, the massive marble fireplace imported from Italy, the enormous rust-colored Dunbar couch with matching armchairs big enough to hold a, quote, well-proportioned bunny, or even a, quote, tete-a-tete -tete couple. The suits of medieval armor, the red room, a monochromatic bedchamber with everything in various shades of red, the blue room decorated in vibrant shades of blue that give an indigo mood. What excited me the most was the pool. Lagoon-like expanse of aquamarine in the languorous South Sea Island setting of thatched huts, palm trees. Let me say that again. What excited me most was the pool. Lagoon-like expanse of aquamarine in a languorous South Sea Island setting of thatched huts, palm trees, and even a cascading waterfall. The house has a supply of bathing suits for guests. But according to the article, many of the mansion mermaids prefer to do their dipping in monokinied or unkinied comfort. Unkinied? Imagine! If a person swims under the waterfall, he or she, preferably both, if a person swims under the waterfall, he or she are preferably both reach the cave, or as time puts it, the woo grotto. It has cushions, soft lights, and music, and is an idyllic spot for couples in search of seclusion at mansion parties. But as the article warned, there is a trap door above so lovers can be spied upon. Mr. Hefner has thought of everything. The house has everything. There is an underwater bar, reachable by either a brass pole or a spiral staircase, with a view of the unkeenied bathers, a game room with a coolly quiet atmosphere reminiscent of the London, a London men's club, and even a bunny dormitory where, quote, cottontail charges have the full run of the mansion's opulent facilities and the comfort and conviviality of their Hefnerian habitat, as well of a set as well as a sun deck where the girls could tan in monokinied or unkinied comfort in full view of adjacent penthouses. The place just had to be the most. I could hardly wait till I got there. Finally, there was Mr. Hafner's own quarters, where anyone entering must remove his shoes, <laughs> quote, to preserve the pristine whiteness of the deep pile wall-to-wall -wall carpeting within. If you know anything about the girls next door, you know that the carpeting in the Playboy Mansion by that time was disgusting and covered with dog feces. Sorry for the side note, but I just thought that was so funny <laughs> that it specifically mentions the beautiful pristine whiteness of the carpeting. Too bad they didn't preserve that. Um, the room, according to the article, was, quote, dominated by, by a robe, okay, dominated by a brobdignagian circle bed, brobdignagian circular bed, eight and a half feet in diameter and equipped with motorized controls that, quote, enable The bed was equipped with motorized controls that, quote, enable Hefner to rotate himself and a dozen passengers, if he wishes, 
a full 360 degrees in either direction. Quote, it goes 33 and a third, 45 and 78 RPM, Hef says. Imagine, we, that would be dizzy love making. Absolutely everything. Mr. Hefner has a rapid dial telephone, which enables him to dial 200 pre-recorded numbers by pushing a single button. The electronic entertainment room, which enables him to automatically pre-record any television program. Watch any of hundreds of movies in his personal library or listen to any of thousands of records. Reading all this, I felt that Hefner's mansion had to be the greatest edifice in the world. What an adventure I was going to have. How thrilling it would be. And all this for taking off my clothes. <clears throat> Pause, let me grab my cat. Good making noise. Baby girl. Okay. Okay, let's see. All this for taking off my clothes. Two. The article impressed me that Mr. Hefner had to be the most remarkable man who ever lived. The article portrayed a man who was the paragon of every virtue. He was generous, providing any food or drink for a guest at any hour of the day or night, and insisting that he or she enjoy his opulent facilities to the fullest. He was a cultural man with movies, televisions, television, shows, and the finest in music at his fingertips constantly with books by his favorite authors at his circular bedside, with the, quote, heroically proportioned seven-foot, semi-abstract bronze statue of modern woman by sculptor Ab Abbott Pattinson, and art by Jackson Pollock, de Koenig, Klein, and Rivers, especially chosen by Hefner to decorate the house. He was a convivial host, throwing lavish and exhaustive parties. No phase of the good life at the mansion matches in reputation the far-flung fame of Hefner's legendary parties, Gatsby-esque, we-for-alls in the grand manner, and the grand manner, that leave the launching pad at midnight and orbit until dawn with a passenger list of 400 to 500 revelers aboard. Sorry, one second, guys. She keeps snacking. Come here, Bubby. Here, have a snack in here. Here you go. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I don't want her little crunching to be in the audio. Okay. He was also an important executive, holding conferences at any hour of the day or night, making, quote, decisions affecting the future expansion of a $70 million Playboy empire around a 12-foot conference table. He was a man of letters, working for days on end in, on, and around the circular bed, writing the, quote, Playboy philosophy and editing the magazine. So hard did he work that he kept five secretaries busy full time on staggered shifts until midnight. Two dictating machines were going constantly. Mr. Hefner was incredibly organized. His bedroom was a clutter of research materials, but he always knew precisely where everything was. If the pristine white rug was cleaned, a map had to be made so every paper could be returned to its former location. He was a free soul, an original and independent thinker, turning night into day, working, sleeping, playing, eating when he wished, not by the dictates of the clock. 
He was known, liked, and admired by nearly every show business luminary and celebrity in the world, most of whom paid him extended visits at the mansion. He was even liked by the dog Humphrey. And yet, he didn't take himself seriously. Remaining a humble man of simple tastes, content with a good pipe, the fellowship of friends, okay, Gandalf, and his work. He had to be, I felt, the greatest. There could never be another like him. And to think I would get to meet him. I wondered if he had personally phoned. Pushing a button for a pre-recorded number on the rapid aisle phone to get me out there to take my clothes off. Me. I was met at the airport by a uniformed chauffeur, a gray-haired man whom I later learned was Herb the Limo, and a black limousine large enough to contain the president's cabinet. Herb the Limo drove me directly to Hefner's four-story house on North State Parkway, opened the door for me to alight, then gathered up my luggage. The battle between the excitement and fear which had been waged in my mind for days was finally won by fear. I guess the limousine ride did it. I'd never ridden in a private limousine before with a chauffeur who held the door and called me Miss. I felt so utterly out of place. Only my determination kept me from bolting. Herb the limo led me through the iron grilled gate and up the steps to the doorway. I felt the cold eye of the television camera on me. I was already naked. Who did I think I was kidding? I was a total nobody. A silly 18 year old girl from Norway. I couldn't be this phony. What was I doing here? Herb the limo said something, I didn't catch what, and the door opened automatically. I was led inside. There in the foyer, was the heroically proportioned seven foot semi-abstract bronze statue of modern woman by sculptor Al Abbott Pattinson. I'd been so eager to see it and it looked awful. A bunch of jagged metal with holes for private parts. I was led up the quote, wine red carpeted grand staircase and through the quote, stark white door set into quote, intricately carved and fixtured walls of oak. I stood inside feeling most awkward. The housekeeper, a kindly, gracious lady appeared. She introduced herself, welcomed me, said Mr. Hefner wanted his guests to enjoy their stay. That anything I wished in the way of food or drink or service was at my disposal at any hour. I was asked to sign the guest book. I was shaking as I approached it. There above it was the abstract splatter painting, number 26, 1950, by the late Jackson Pollock, second only to Picasso in the hierarchy of 20th century art. Lord, it looked like splattered paint. My hand shook as I picked up the pen. What was I doing? Adding my name to Mort Saul and Marvin Belli and the Maharaja of Jaipur and June the Bosom Wilkinson. Oh, and Theodore Roosevelt. I scrawled Salve Mellenborgen. God, I had to change that name. I wandered into the baronial main room. It was just as the Playboy article had described it. Huge, 60 feet long, 30 feet wide, 22 feet high. Ornately paneled and equipped precisely as described. There was the massive marble flat fireplace imported from Italy, the beautiful British beam ceiling, the pair of wrought bronze chandeliers with matching candelabra shaped sconces, the ebony grand piano, the medieval armor, the enormous overstuffed furniture to hold well-proportioned bunnies, the stacks of pillows for floor sitting, and the custom-built 15-foot freestanding stereo hi-fi console, which was, quote, behind the giant couch and with it acting as a room divider. I had two, really three impressions. I don't mean to be unkind. The huge room was truly a marvel, plush, lavish, extraordinarily masculine, the epitome of luxury. I'm sure I stood open-mouthed looking at it. But despite this feeling, I had my first impression that it somehow wasn't real. Everything was spotless and shining and precisely in its place. It was extraordinarily formal, casual it was not. There were no newspapers or magazines tossed on the Dunbar couch. 
No one had abandoned an empty glass or made use of an ashtray or even left a finger mark on the ornately carved oak panel walls or the sliding clear lucite top of the hi-fi, which permits the hi-fi neophyte to gander at the gear without messing with it. I guess that was it. Nobody messed with nothing. Therefore, nobody lived there. It wasn't the main room of somebody's home. It was a place for show, a museum, the East Room of the White House, or maybe King Olaf's castle in Oslo. My second impression was that the room was familiar. This was puzzling. I couldn't account for it. I'd been there before, only I hadn't. Perhaps the elaborate descriptions and pictures in the Playboy article caused the feeling. I wasn't sure. The first two impressions combined, I guess, to create the third. I was disappointed. I knew I shouldn't be. I certainly didn't want to be. I never told myself, I told myself realities never live up to expectations. Renee Rossini appeared. I can't, ex I can't recall her exact title, but it seems to me that Renee Rossini was called something like Playmate Coordinator. I didn't know what there is to coordinate about Playmates, but by whatever name, she was the boss. She was in charge of me, which in her language meant she was there to help me in any way she could. If I had desires, needs, or problems, just ask her. Renee Rossini was an attractive, very sophisticated woman in her 30s, I guess. A redhead, smartly, smartly dressed. She talked a great deal. It was as if her tongue would fall out if she didn't keep using it. And every word was very, very, very affected. Salve, darling, it is so good to see you. You are so lovely, so lovely. I can see why you were chosen, oh my yes. And that dress, so divine, so exquisite. You have such good taste. Somehow, the way she said it, I just knew I looked lousy and my dress was a rag. You're going to have such a nice time here and we do want you to enjoy it. Anything you want, anything, just say the word, understand? I didn't feel off to a very good start with she who was to coordinate me. Renee Rossini took me on a quick tour of the house, main room, dining room. Order anything you want, anything. She led me downstairs to peek at the pool. I was sure she'd tell me I could be unkeenied. She didn't. The massage room, the steam room, then down again to the underwater bar. She, so she showed me the pole to slide down, but we took what Playboy was, we took what Playboy had called the narrow winding stone walled staircase. The bar was decorated with transparencies of playmates. I guess I'd be hung there soon. After returning to the main room, she took me to my room. My room. Itself a bit of a production. She led me through oak paneled double doors at the east end of the main room. Along a wall was the entrance to the red room, that warmly monochromatic bedchamber, and to its right the entrance to the blue room where an indigo mood prevails amid vibrant shades of blue. In between the two doorways was an ornate brass panel. Renee touched the panel and, like magic, it slid back to reveal a short hallway and a spiral staircase carpeted in white. I'm sure I gasped. She chuckled. It is a surprise, isn't it? Here, I'll show you. After the door slid back automatically, she showed me the proper button to press on the panel. It opened again and closed behind us as we started up the staircase. For the first time, I was truly impressed. My goodness, a secret door. The spiral staircase led to the gold room. The 14,000 word article on Hefner's mansion made no mention of the gold room. The red room and the blue room were amply des described, but not a word that the gold room existed. The omission puzzled me then and still does. There was certainly no reason to be ashamed of it. It was a large room with three windows, a large bed, table, two chairs, television, and ornate lamps. The rug was gold, the draperies beige, the walls off-white. Green chairs were the accent color. I'd call it a warmly monochromatic bedroom, but the red room was already that. 
How about a coolly expensive bedchamber? Renee showed me the adjacent private bath, the phone with list of numbers for everyone in the building. No rapid dial phone for me, though. And an intercom to the kitchen over which I could order anything, anything at all. She explained how to reach her if I needed anything, how to order the limousine, and left me to unpack. I did the usual things, exploring the drawers, closet, and bath as I unpacked. I remember standing before the mirror for a few moments, looking at myself, wondering if I were really I, and what was I doing there? I felt so strange, so uncomfortable, so lost, and terribly lonesome. I wanted to go back to where I belonged. But you're here, I spoke aloud. You're going to stay. You're going to be good. You're a big girl now, Salve Mellenborgen. Salve Mellenborgen. Sunny road in the middle of the city. Rain in the gold room was more like it. Salve Mellenborgen. The name had to go. For one thing, I was forever explaining it. Nobody could spell it. And if they saw it spelled, I was called Salvig instead of Salve. I needed something simpler. More importantly, I hoped my parents would never learn what I was doing. I had to change my identity. To what? I'd always liked Salve, such a pretty name. I wanted one equally good, and I wanted to keep my initials, S-M. I tried the names beginning with S that I'd heard. Sarah, Sue, Samantha, Cynthia. I didn't know that began with a C. And I rejected them, I rejected them all. Then I tried rhyming Salve. Salve, Salve, Silve, Sulve, Sarve, Serve, hmm, Serve, Serve, no, sur Serve, not bad, Serve, Serve, Serde, Serme, Serpe, Serre, hmm, Serre. I'd been accenting the second syllable so that I was saying Serre. I changed the accent. Sure. Sure. No, no. Sure. Then it changed from R A Y to R E Y. Sure. Salve. Sure. Yes, sure. I like the sound. I had no idea what it meant or if it was a word. I just liked the sound. Later, people would tell me it was a ridiculous name, a buggy, but I didn't care what people thought. I liked it. Saray. Saray what? Saray Mel, heavens no. Saray Melum, no, awful. Saray Mark? Saray Marks? No. Saray March? Hmm, Saray March. Saray Marsh? Yes, yes, Saray Marsh. I said the name several times. I liked the sound. I tried writing it and perfected the spelling by adding the E to Marsh. Saray Marsh. I looked in the mirror again and addressed myself by my new name. Saray Marsh, you have a new name. You're a new girl. Then why don't you look like it or act like it or feel like it? I chastised myself. What was the matter with me? Here I was, selected as one of the most beautiful girls in the world. Here I was, staying in this big, wonderful, spectacular house with all these fun things to do. Here I was, a new person with a new name. And what was I doing? Moping around, feeling lonesome and sorry for myself. Get with it, girl. Get with it. My spirits lightened. I left the gold room and meandered down the spiral staircase and right into a blank wall. The secret door. How did it open? Oh God, Saray Marsh wasn't a bit smarter than Solvay Mellenborgen. Button. Rene Rossini had said something about a button to open the door from this side. I felt around for a magic button. Nothing. Button, button. Oh, where was the damn button? I started back to the gold room. I'd have to phone downstairs for help. Hello, this is Sire Marsh. Who? The railing. Renee had said something about the button being on the railing. I felt around. No button. Almost frantically, I expanded the search, then found it on the underside of the railing four steps up. As I touched it, the panel 
magically slid open. Alibaba, open sesame. I raced through it as it closed behind me. No one was around, and I didn't know what to do with myself. I wandered around the house for a while, peering at the medieval armor, the hi-fi. I'd never dare mess with it. Lifting the cover on the piano keys. I was restless. There were no newspapers, and Playboy was the only magazine. <laughs> I picked it up, then discarded it. For some reason, I wasn't interested in gaping at boobies. I didn't know what to do with myself. I looked at my watch. Maybe I was hungry. I didn't feel hungry, but it was something to do. I went into the dining room and sat down. A negro, a butler, I guess, appeared, spoke in a very friendly manner, and took my order, steak with mushrooms. It was a beautiful steak, and I ate it all. As I ate, a man came in and sat opposite me. He was of medium height in his 40s and balding. He said his name was Jean. And I'm Sir A. Marsh. It sounded strange. Very pretty name. Are you a bunny? Well, not here. In New York. I'm here to do a centerfold. Really? Well, gee, that's great. I didn't want to talk about it. I asked him what he did. It's a little hard to explain. Just say I work on dirty movies. I raised an eyebrow. He didn't look or act like a dirty movie man. We chatted about New York, my trip, bunnies, the house. I was grateful to have someone to talk to. I liked him. He struck me as a nice man. I left him at the table and went back to the gold room. What did I do now? I looked around at the monochromatic decor, then remembered the pool. I'd been dying to get in that famous pool. Swim under the waterfall into the Woo Grotto. Now is the time to do it. I changed into my green bikini. I wasn't about to be unkinied or even monokinied. When I went down to the pool, I guess I expected the scenes depicted in Playboy. Stitchless Allison Parks standing booby deep in the pool. Donna Michelle and Ashlyn Martin swimming underwater as though hunting their swimsuits. A bevy of bare bells splashing in the waterfall. Or I guess I figured there'd be a merry party going on with Mr. Hefner being thrown in to emerge still puffing on his pipe as the magazine described. I was disappointed to find the pool empty. Not even one bare bell. Not a ripple on the lagoon-like expanse of aquamarine. Not even a wet footprint among the thatched huts and palms to show that a bather had been there. I dived in. The water was warm and nice, but who wants to swim alone? I swam around the pool and passed the window for the underwater bar. Somebody might be watching. And under the waterfall and into the woo grotto. I looked up and saw the trap door high above and sat on the cushions and felt as alone in the world as I ever had in my life. Woo? Who? It really was a lovely pool with a fascinating Polynesian atmosphere. Yet I couldn't shake the feeling that it was somehow familiar. I'd never been in a pool even remotely resembling this one. So why did I feel I'd seen it before? I had the feeling throughout the house. The red room, the blue room, the secret door and spiral staircase, the stone steps leading to the underwater bar, the Negro butler serving me in the paneled dining room. This nagging feeling of familiarity bothered me. It was like trying to figure out where I'd seen a familiar face. Then suddenly I realized where I'd seen all this. The late show. This pool with its thatched hut, lush tropical palms, waterfall and secret grotto was straight out of an old Dorothy L'Amour movie. No, not straight out, but very similar. Somehow I expected Dorothy, draped in her sarong, to swim giggling under the waterfall, pursued by a panting and determined John Hall. The baronial main hall. Sure, the furniture was more modern, and there was the big hi-fi, but still, the flavor was straight out of the old swashbucklers. Errol Flynn or Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Sabres flashing. Plumed hats waving. Would have felt right at home amid the suits of armor. Beamed ceiling, huge fireplace, and oak paneling. It would be so appropriate for Charles Boyer or Humphrey Bogart to walk down the stone staircase for a conspiratorial tete-a-tete -tete in the subterranean bar. The whole place was right out of the movies. Old movies of the 1930s and 1940s. Clark Gable cunningly pushing the secret button, mounting the spiral stairs to surprise and subdue Carol Lombard. 
Betty Davis in the red room, Cary Grant in the blue room. It all fit. I felt I had made a discovery which helped me <clears throat> I felt I had made a discovery which helped me understand Hefner's cold, lifeless mansion. It was a museum, a, wind, a windy city Hollywood, a monument to the late show, and it made Mr. Hefner seem more human. A boy grows up, becomes rich, and builds a house to mirror the movies he'd marveled at. The American dream come true. He couldn't help it that Hollywood movies, being unreal, made his unbelievably luxurious house unreal. I swam out of the grotto, got out of the pool, and went into the steam room for 15 minutes. I was alone. I tried to imagine, I tried to imagine my hiding in the corner while George Raft and James Cagney came in to plot a bank heist, but I wasn't too successful. On my way upstairs, I looked in the game room. It was reminiscent of a London's men's club, all right. All it needed was Basil Rathbone. As I went back to the gold room, I made a game of trying to imagine various film stars in appropriate places throughout the house. But the fun soon wore thin. I dressed and went downstairs. Some bunnies, home from the day shift, were gathered in the main room. Jean, whom I'd met at dinner, saw me and introduced me to the girls. This is Saray. She's going to do a centerfold. I was greeted with a chorus of highs and hello there's, but I can't say anyone was overjoyed to see me. That's probably my fault. An evening with bunnies didn't throw me. I sat for a while taking, I sat for a while talking over a cup of tea. It was all right. I compared notes on the New York and Chicago clubs, found out how they liked living there, groovy, how they liked the house, the most, and what they thought of Mr. Hafner, the greatest. After a while, the crowd broke up and Jean invited me to his room. He was staying in the red room and thought I might like to see it. I went, it was red. We talked a while about what I don't recall. I was grateful for any sort of company and he was very nice, but I was terribly restless. I just couldn't get interested in what he was telling me. I think it was about his work. I know he had a lot of Playboy magazines scattered about. After a while, I tended to lose all track of time in the house. I went back to the main room, sat around, then just have something to do, ate something. A sandwich, I guess. Some bunnies were around. I listened and said a few words, but I just wasn't turned on. Finally, I went to bed. It was early, and I wasn't tired or sleepy, but I couldn't think of anything else to do. Lying there in bed in the dark, I tried to figure it all out. I knew I was lonesome. I'd been lonesome all day long. There were people around, Rene Rossini, Jean, a dozen bunnies, but I just didn't belong. I didn't blame them. They were nice and tried, but none of them really interested me. Here I'd come to this fabulous place, this libido capital of the universe, the hub of an empire embracing free love and fun. And here I was suffering the worst, and here I was suffering the worst malady that can befall man, boredom. I was bored out of my mind. Maybe tomorrow would be better. And that is the end of chapter six. Next up is chapter seven, Strangers in Paradise. Ta-da! Thank you guys so much for listening to that chapter. That was super interesting. Little insight into Chicago mansion. I love that. And I really wanted to see that pool. <laughs> That would be so cool. So please remember to subscribe and like this video. That way you will get more announcements whenever the next chapter comes out. I'll probably read the next chapter, chapter seven tomorrow, and I'll schedule the live in case you guys want to save it. And that way you can actually listen to it live. So yay, that was such an interesting chapter. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you have a lovely day or night wherever you are and I will talk to you soon.